Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm the Chief Knowledge Broker at Octo, Open Communications for the Ocean. And we are very happy today to welcome uh, Claudia Quintanilla and Katie Hefner of RARE to speak about applying behavioral insights to improve marine conservation. Um, before we get started, uh, I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. Um, the presentation will have an initial presentation from Claudia and Katie, and then we'll have dedicated time for questions at the end. We encourage you to send any questions you have um, as they occur to you, and you can send them in either through the chat, you can uh, make them visible to everyone or just the panelists, um, or you can send them into the Q&A, in which case they'll just be visible um, to the panelists. Um, either way is fine. Um, and I would let you know our chat is open for um, comments and questions and thoughts, and we encourage you to use it. Um, just keep it on the topic, um, and you can make you can choose again if you enter something into the chat to make it visible just to Claudia, Katie, and I, um, just to myself if it's just an organizational matter, um, or to everyone, all attendees. But and again, we love to hear to get your input during the the webinar. But we just please keep it on the topic. Um, so again, uh, I'll turn it over to Claudia and Katie now, and uh, we're excited to hear what you have to say. Great, thank you, Sarah. And welcome everyone to our webinar on applying behavioral insights to marine conservation. So I'm Katie Hefner. I am Senior Director of Partnerships and Engagement at Rare's Center for Behavior and the Environment. And I'm joined by most my most fabulous Claudia, colleague, Claudia, who I will let introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Claudia Quintanilla. I am the lead for the Global Collaboration Hub of the Fish Fiber Program, and we focus on kind of being a link between all of our wonderful scientists, both from the social and fisheries part of, of our brain at RARE and practitioners on the ground. So lovely to be here with you today. Thank you. All right. So just jumping right in for the um, purposes of time. So environmental challenges all have one thing in common. Someone somewhere, whether it's a farmer, a fisher, a government leader, a general consumer, a corporate leader, someone somewhere needs to do something differently. So environmental challenges are often at their core behavioral challenges. And so to address them, we need behavioral solutions. RARE, as an organization, we're an international nonprofit that has been applying behavioral insights over the last 40 to 50 years to tackle some of the world's greatest conservation and sustainability challenges. So we've worked in more than 500 different communities uh, to, in 60 countries all over the world to apply behavioral sciences to address environmental problems. And today, Claudia and I are going to talk to you a little bit about how we've seen those um, insights be successfully applied into some marine contexts. So before we get going, we just wanted to start out with a little bit of a poll. So here's a question for everybody. You're about to buy a new phone charger for $21.99 and then learn that the exact same charger is available for $12.99 at another store 10 minute walk away. Would you go walk to, to the other store to get that charger? So I think Sarah is actually going to open a poll for us and you can answer yes or no. So would you walk to go get the other charger? We'll give that a minute, but I'm seeing quite a few yeses come in, a few no's, um, but overwhelmingly we're getting some yeses come through. So we'll just give it a couple more seconds for folks. Okay. Right. Okay. Got, yeah. yeah, that works. 
All right, so overwhelmingly, you can see most people would walk that 10 minutes to go um, get the other charger. So now I'm gonna ask you a second question. You're about to buy a MacBook for $1,329 when you learn that the exact same MacBook is available for $1,320 at another store, 10 minute walk away. Would you walk to the other store to get that MacBook? And Sarah, can you open that poll for us? So results are coming in. People are voting. I think we can probably close that. So you can see a tremendously different response here where overwhelmingly 90% answered yes, yeah, over 90% answered yes to the first one, but the majority actually answered no on the second one. But fundamentally, I just asked you the exact same question, which was, would you walk 10 minutes to save $9. So this isn't supposed to be some trick or anything. What this is trying to demonstrate is that it, our brains are not purely rational. They're not purely economic. And we think about information differently depending on the context. So when we think about context and we think about our decision-making, we like to think about it in terms of a spectrum. So on the one hand, we do have this very rational perspective for how we make decisions. It's very, we will um, calculate a return on investment, we'll understand the costs and the benefits, we'll be very intentional about our choices and, and really thoughtful. On the other side, we have this almost emotional, instinctive, reactive, it's very quick in making our decisions. And, and that is another way that we make our choices over the course of the day. The reality is in the tens of thousands of choices that we make every day over our lifetime and over our lifetimes, we fall along the spectrum. Some are very rational, some are very emotional, and some are somewhere in the middle. Now, when we look though at um, environmental challenges and the kinds of solutions that we're developing, the most common tactics that environmentalists use for developing, um, uh, uh, for developing interventions to motivate change among our desired audiences, they are designed for one end of that spectrum. They're designed to address and think about one type of, of thinking. That's the rational side. So we think, you know, if, uh, material incentives, if we just pay them, that will motivate change. If we create a law, we'll tell them they have to stop doing that. That will make them just having to stop. Or if we give them information, if we just told them and they knew how big that island of trash floating in the Pacific was, that would stop them and motivate them to use reusable bags. Now, the reality exists that these can be very impactful and effective in driving change, but sometimes they are not. They can often be insufficient. And there's some reasons for that. Sometimes with material incentives, they can, um, they can backfire. They can um, be seen as the cost of doing business. Sometimes rules can be difficult to enforce, particularly um, when we are in these remote areas or, or too crowded to actually track. Um, information doesn't always motivate change either. Think about the last time you know all of these different things that are good for you, whether it's eating more healthy, whether it's exercising, there's all these things that you know that you should be doing, but that doesn't always mean that you will do them. And so as we think back to this spectrum, of change, we need to remember that there's this whole other side of the equation that motivates us to act. And so there are these other levers that we can add to our toolbox to help drive people make change towards environmental, um, pro-environmental behaviors, to things that we want them to do in, um, for the benefit of the environment. That can look like um, an emotional appeal. So emotions can often drive us to act over our reason. It can be a social influence, a social norm. We take our lead from others. We care what other people think, and we want to be part of our peer book group. We want them to think about us positively. And there's another category that we call choice architecture, which is the structure and timing of a decision-making environment, because the context, it matters, and it matters a lot. You saw that even with the questions that I asked you, the context around whether you would buy the charger 
or the MacBook and save that $9 with the 10 minutes walk, it changed. Even though the, the fundamental question, the fundamental material economic question remained the same. So we need to think about all of these levers when driving change. The reality is when we're developing these levers is there's also all sorts of different strategies. I'm including this very big list here. Um, we have them all listed on our website at behavior.rare.org. Um, but this is really, these are all sorts of strategies you can use for the whole spectrum of decision-making to drive change and really play to the, your audience and your target audience's um, motivations and key drivers and, um, and tackle some of those barriers that they are facing. So what Claudia and I are not saying here though, and when we talk about these levers and we talk through our examples, is that you take any one of these behavioral strategies that you see on this slide and you just throw it at your marine program. Like we're not saying that you should tap into a core emotion such as happiness and just use that automatically. We need to be very intentional about the strategies that we're using with our audiences and understanding what motivates them and apply strategic, strategically apply the right levers. So I'm sharing here on this side, let's see, there we go. Um, a, an organizational, a programmatic theory of change often looks like this. You have some outcomes that are driven by outputs, and then you have some program activities that kind of lead into those outputs. So for example, you might have a poster or community event um, that then drives people having some sort of output, such as um, having a straw or a plastic bag, and then that leads to some sorts of conservation result, like re reduced pollution or waste. And what we promote and what we realize is there's actually something magical that we're making in this box, a black box of assumptions that we're making that drives from programmatic activities to the outcomes. And it's almost like a hidden spectrum of decision making. It's the hidden spectrum inside people's minds about what is changing between the activities that they're experiencing and driving those outputs that you're hoping to achieve. So at our center, we often talk about a theory of change that has the outcomes, um, puts the outputs as behaviors, because that's what we're really focused on is creating and motivating a change in behavior, um, not at necessarily attitudes, not necessarily in beliefs, though, though those can be motivational and moving towards behaviors, not always, but sometimes. Um, but that also our program activities where we clearly articulate the psychological and social states that we're addressing and changing and using our strategies effectively in making that change happen. So you're identifying how do you anticipate using your activities to influence behavior change, influence decision making, and then drive impact on the behaviors that will then lead to the conservation outcomes that you hope to achieve. So going even more broadly, when you think about strategically designing for impact, um, when we're developing the interventions, identifying which levers to use, identifying um, how, which program activities we should be accomplishing to address the problem that we're trying to achieve, what we promote using is this um, eight-step approach. We say step, but it can be very iterative. It's not necessarily linear. Um, but this eight-step approach to designing interventions um, that help you identify the outcome you're hoping to achieve and then the activities that will get you there. So in these eight steps, um, we go through a little bit um, of an intentional strategic and stepped approach. The first is this uh, step called frame. And this is where you really identify what you want your audience to do. So you do Oftentimes a systems map, you identify who are all the different actors involved, but then you also identify very specifically what is the behavior that you want people to do and who you want to do that. And so one example that I often use is you're not just saying, um, I want to reduce food waste. Food waste appears in a number of different um, in a number of different ways, in a number of different types of behaviors. You could have people shop less so that they have less spoilage um, at home. You could have them um, eating their leftovers. 
You could have them um, composting because the, you don't want the waste going as methane, um, de decomposing as methane instead of as compost that can be used as fertilizer. So there's lots of different um, behaviors associated with food waste. And so being very specific about who you want to do something and what you want them to do and articulating that in the frame step. Then it's to empathize. And that empathizing, this empathizing step is critically important because it is not what we think and it is not what we think our target audience thinks, but it is really understanding what is our target audience's experience and what are their motivations, their behaviors and starting to understand what drives their decision-making and parsing out how you can, um, can start understanding their experience in the, uh, with regards to the behavior that you're trying to address. So the next step is then mapping the behavioral insights and the levers and identifying what can you draw from their experience and how do you start understanding their, um, that spectrum of decision-making, understanding what motivates them, what are some of the barriers, un understanding the behavioral science that underpins um, the, the challenge that they're facing. And this is where you can start putting in um, some of the levers and matching that all together. Now that's when you get to start ideating solutions and coming up with all sorts of different strategies that might be quite work best. And then going through to pick one, um, I, prototyping it, doing a small scale version of it, testing it, and then when it is effective, um, and once you find that it is effective, rolling that out large scale and, and measuring your results. Now, you can see where there might be times where you go back to previous steps or keep iterating along the way um, to practice and figure out what works um, most effectively in driving the kind of change you want to achieve. Now, one of the important things that you'll see here that happens quite a bit is when you work in, in, um, in a mission-based organization, um, oftentimes, once we go through the frame step and you identify what the problem is and what you want people to do, so you want people um, to start uh, eating their leftovers, it's very, um, it's very common for us to just want to start ideating solutions, to skip the empathizing and mapping stage and to say, okay, I want to get my audience to start eating their leftovers, and you just start coming up with ideas for how you can, and can um, tackle that challenge and, motiv and motivate change. But what is really important here, and it seems super obvious, but can be very, very painful to do to slow yourself down and really actually um, practice it when you are doing these interventions, is time and again to take, take that moment and empathize and map and really be the stepped approach because that is how you'll get to the kinds of breakthrough solutions um, and to a really designing something with your target audience in mind to tackle uh, the behaviors that you're hoping to address. So with that little intro, I'm actually gonna turn it over to my colleague, uh, Claudia, to give you a little bit of an example and a little bit of a stretch break uh, so that you can jump in and start seeing this stuff in action. So Claudia, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and then turn it over to you. Yeah. While we do that, um, as Katie said, we'll do a little bit of stretching just because why not? Um, and so if you are able to move a little tiny bit away from your desk, just to uh, you can have some space and we'll get right to it. <clears throat> and hopefully you will find this as enjoyable as we do. Um, so stretch your arms up. If you have ever set an alarm because you need to remember um, to drink water or to take a pill or to get up from your chair or whatever it is that you need to remember. Just give yourself a good kind of good wiggle wiggle, stretch up, stretch up. And if you have, congratulations, you are already an expert at choice architecture. That is really the lever that's around changing the context in which, which we make our choices, um, either directing attention to something, simplifying messages or decisions, using timely moment uh, reminders and plans and facilitating planning and goal setting. So you've done it already very well. All right, circle your wrist because we know we spend way too much time on our computers anyway. If you've spent a lot of time doing something just because you got better with practice and that made you feel great. So 
hopefully everybody's stretching their wrist a little bit now with so much pandemic time, you know, so many new hobbies that we've acquired, baking, care, taking care of plants, gardening, etc. You have been tapped into by emotional appeals, if this is your case. Um, really, emotional appeals is about using emotional drive messages to drive behaviors. It really leverages very specific emotions and specific contests. In this particular uh, case, it was about pride. It was about joy, right, of something that you uh, find in doing this activity. And it's also a lot about personalizing the message. So being able to have the right messenger, the right type of uh, person that we can relate to that is um, that is the person that we are receiving of a, a message that we want our audiences to, to kind of absorb. All right, one very last. So make circles with your feet also because we've been sitting too long, um, probably. If you've ever watched a show, a series or a movie, just because everybody else seems to be Look, seeing this and talking about it, and um, they can't hear enough about it except you, and you do not want to be that person who doesn't know about Game of Thrones. I was that person, but maybe you don't want to be that person. Um, and if you have been circling your feet, that means you have fallen to the wondrous um, trap of lever of social influences, which is really levering the behavior, beliefs, and expectations of others. You can kind of use this lever in a very positive way if you can make engaging or not engaging in a behavior observable. So if I see that you are or are not doing something in particular, you can make the target behavior be the perceived norm, and you can eliminate excuses for not engaging in behavior. Hopefully this gave you just kind of another, another take on how so many of these levers we use in our everyday life, they are, they exist, um, and a little bit of a stretch break. So now let me share with you how we actually use um, both the levers and the behavior center design process within the Fish Forever program. So challenge in small scale fisheries, I think we're all familiar with how challenging it is to have accurate data. Um, on this very important sector and this is the population. We need data to make management decisions. Pretty straightforward challenge. Um, and so what we did within Fish Forever was, all right, let's think of this wondrous um, app that we can uh, use. And uh, the app was made for the first buyer in the Fisheries Valley chain to use. And so we thought, great. We'll have to kind of, um, we can sidestep, you know, kind of the resource intensiveness of having to go boat to boat, kind of recording all these, all this fish catch. It's not the most, it's not exact. We know that it's a proxy, but it is better than not having this information. So um, we've been work, had been working with this app for about three or four years, and we're like, great, you know, everything should be, of course, straightforward and wonderful expectations versus reality, what actually happened was that um, we started to notice that in the absence of continual user support of actual staff supporting um, buyers to use the app, it really, the use really dropped off after two months. And so a kind of that left us with was this really interesting frame um, question around what is the actual challenge now that we have this app that you know we're intending to use. It's really a behavioral challenge. It's really how might we influence the fish buyers to use the R fish app accurately and consistently to reg register their transactions. And notice really how we put in bold accurately and consistently as a really important, I think, part of of a frame, right? It's not to use it just because you can use it every once in a while, as kind of Katie mentioned in the beginning when she went over the BCD steps, but it's really having that specificity of what that like actual behavior and action meant. I think for us, what was really interesting to reflect on is that we needed to really shift our own focus, right, from really the value of the data for us as, as fishery managers or as a people that are really trying to influence the sector to really the value of the data for fish buyers and fishers, right? That was the real shift that I think, um, at least in this frame stage, really needed to happen for us to kind of 
focus on, you know, and really um, pinpoint what were those important motivations and barriers for um, fish buyers and fishers to be able to use it. So after that, we moved into this kind of empathetic stage. And what happened here was staff in the Philippines, Indonesia, and Honduras interviewed buyers that both that had used the app and continued to use it and that did not, that had started using it and then did, had stopped using it. So we have that comparison, right, of what's the, the people that are engaging in the behavior that we want and those that are not. Um, and we have a full um, uh, kind of interview guide that everybody followed. Everybody gather, gathered that information, kind of sorted it out, categorized it, clustered it. And what we found were a whole series of things, right, that kind of surfaced for us. In terms of motivations, it was everything from, you know, it's really nice when rare staff come and they have an interest and take their time to sit and talk with me. Um, to, yeah, I actually, you know, I need this information to report to the government. And in terms of barriers, I think kind of like, some of the things that we might imagine showed up, like I can't use a smartphone um, or other people use some of this, the phone in my family for other things to, you know, I don't want to get hacked. So there's a whole slew of things that kind of surfaced and bubbled up once we um, processed the information and, you know, we can't, couldn't work on it all. So we really decided to kind of pluck out what, what and focus on these uh, motivations and barriers that were highlighted here. Um, and that just had kind of different kinds of motivations behind them. That's what our, uh, from the perception and our experience from the staff, you know, these were the ones that were kind of identified to be as most critical. So we can focus on that. And then further distilling it down, um, what we really, really got to was the core of really the motivation is that the magic is in the data, right? This data is powerful. This data will allow us to have a better uh, business if we can actually capture it. And really the main barrier that we were trying to get around was how can we have enough data, people recording it with enough consistency that the volume of the data is uh, what is in the end, what is important, right? To be able to make it valuable, to be able to see patterns and trends. So those were kind of like the two um, main opposing forces that, um, that we were looking at. Um, I think the other thing that was just really interesting was uh, somebody asked a picture of, of sorry, a question around like mapping and how to do that. But I think also what would kind of surface and this kind of empathize step was really a clearer, this clearer picture of complexity. And again, if we place ourselves in kind of the place where fishers and fish buyers would, would place us, right, as kind of natural resources managers or field staff, et cetera, we're pretty far removed, you know, from their from who influences them and what influences of their reality. So it was interesting also just to like figure out like where we really kind of landed in kind of this map of, of their importance. Um, so kind of leading from there, we went, this is kind of map ID and prototype all kind of squished together. Um, we landed on three key solutions that we wanted to, to and to um, roll out. The solutions were focused primarily in these four, and then um, kind of like key, so to speak, kind of premises of the magic of accurate and consistent data, fish buying the household business. So we really wanted to emphasize the importance of it for the household, um, digital literacy. We definitely, um, that was uh, a huge component of, you know, that, that we needed to address. And then the last one is a regular, frequent, and personalized support that buyers could, um, that, you know, buyers could gain access to. So we have these three kind of solutions: um, the user journey, the community event, and the manual. I'll talk a little bit about them each. So in the user journey, this is actually a tool that we developed for our staff. Um, this is not something that goes to the fishers or the fish, the, 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 the fish buyers. Really what this is, is a roadmap to guide behavior adoption interventions. And you'll see here the kind of the voice architecture kind of icon uh, very prominent because what, because we realized that the, the 
frequent, the personalized and the regular support was actually such a key driver to behavior adoption. We really wanted to give our, our implementation team somewhat of a, of a guide, of a blueprint of what we thought, you know, based on all of their observations and like out of their experience, what would be a kind of a logical sequence of, of events that they could do. Um, this also came with a whole other kind of um, template or like um, explanation of how to adapt it, also how to best adapt it, you know, to in any particular context so people could like swap, um, you know, some of these boxes around, take them down, put new ones in, depending on, on what it is that they thought would be more, more appropriate. But again, at least you know you're not starting from scratch, and like there's a sense of like there is a continuity in an intervention. Um, and anyway, so the central line kind of sequence behavior milestones um, that our fish users should attain over time, and then kind of the top part is what the buyers are experiencing. So if you think about the um, the theories of change that Katie presented, is it goes more or less in the same logic where you have uh, kind of what are people's feelings and thoughts uh, kind of on the top level and then like what are the program interventions in the middle row and then oh, that will like lead to the behaviors the very kind of specific very small micro behaviors that we would hope people um would would start kind of demonstrating and then the bottom part is really more of a guide for like impl implementers like things you should be thinking about things that you, you should plan to do we have some metrics in there um, as well the second um, solution that we worked on was as a community event plan. Um, this you can see was really around creating a social norm and support for using our fish within the household. So really, really kind of trying to leverage social influences. We heard a lot from the um, the uh, qualitative research. You know, the smartphone is a family asset. Other is the only smartphone in smartphone in the household, other people want to use it and within my family, you know, like the kids will take it, whatever. So we we're like, all right, like let's um, kind of capitalize on that, so to speak, in terms of like how can we, and it really is like a, a household business. Um, so how can we integrate that a little bit more clearly and in, in how we kind of approach this. Um, so the goal, well, let's see it there, participants, it was at least one fisher buyer per one fish buyer household anywhere between two and two and a half hours. The event plan has seven components to it. Um, and, and you'll see, for example, in the a day in the life of the family, we're really kind of focusing on this, you know, knowing the state of the fishery is important for our home. And then in the magic of the data, really kind of capitalizing on, you know, using our fish is easy, knowing also the state of the fishery is important. There's a competition in there. Um, et cetera. And so that kind of plays into also information and a little bit of emotional appeals as well. And the third one, which I guess is kind of the most expected one was our fish ambassador manual. Um, and it's called an ambassador manual because the idea behind this is that um, more experienced our fish users can really have a tool you know, that they can go and kind of visit their peers. Um, it's a very easy, kind of, uh, as you'll see, it's very visual, very easy to follow. If not, if it's not a peer-to-peer -peer kind of visit, you could have, like, um, you can envision like a, an extensionist or some sort of government liaison doing this very easily as well. And not necessarily, you know, they don't have to be as familiar with the app as, you know, we might have done in the past. And so, this is really about um, the information bit, but also the choice architecture, again, in terms of like, what is the reliable, consistent support that people, you know, need to be available in, all, in order for them to, to be able to really um, be consistent with, with behavior. Um, different sections of it really focused on different parts of, of information that were needed. As you can see, you know, this first page is, I can't use the smartphone, so, you know, People were asking like, how to delete caches? All right, so we threw it in here. No, we didn't. We would have not expected that if we had not asked. Um, then, you know, kind of really straightforward, just being able to use that app correctly. We have so many pages just 
full of these um, of these little graphs here. And, and I think this last part also kind of starts to surface a little bit of emotional appeals in terms of the messaging. So here, for example, we have an insight, which is accurate financial information is important. And so how we like reflected it in the manual a little bit differently in terms of, you know, just explaining what these graphs in the app mean, because they're not necessarily um, the most intuitive for folks that are not, you know, as readily um, used to, to dealing with, with you know, like a financial chart. I'm certainly one of those people. Um, and also really thinking about what are the key messages that really tap into, you know, the value of this information for their business. And so we have some, some key, included some key messaging around that into the manual as well that um, ambassadors could, could use. So there's a little bit of, of everything in there. And last but not least, cannot um, not mention and just give a huge shout out to the 21 people spread across the rare world that really contributed um, from all different kind of expertise and lenses and, and, and really made this um, possible. So great. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Katie. Sorry, I was trying to figure out where my mute button had moved to. <laughs> Great. So one thing that we wanted to just highlight quickly um, as an example is that this stuff has been effective by so many other organizations doing lots of other types of projects around the world, too. It's not just something um, that Rare has used in our program. So we pulled this one. I don't know um, if you've heard from uh, about Eviden. They're a program in Australia. They were working on this program called Project Cane Changer. Um, what it was designed to do is um, the Great Barrier Reef. It's is, which is off the coast of Australia, is obviously one of the world's largest coral reef systems that exist. And it's been threatened by climate change, but also by um, a lot of runoff from fertilizers coming from the sugarcane farms of, all across Australia. And the runoff occurs when these farmers are using synthetic fertilizers um, and they seep into the waterways and then flow down into the ocean. And so the Australian government had tried numerous different ways of driving change through um, enacting laws, offering economic incentives, but change had been really slow um, in, and had really been insufficient in tackling the challenge. And so Project Cane Changer came about where they decided to try things a little bit differently and to reduce the use, they were targeting reducing the use of chemical fertilizers and improving irrigation and drainage overall. And so they started this thing called, um, it's called Smart Cane Best Management Practices, um, which is when they started working with cane, with farmers uh, to in, enact new and make some sustainable improvements to their farms. But what was most important and impactful is that they partnered with the farmers and the farmers, um, it was under a campaign called Second, Setting the Record Straight. And it transitioned to the narrative from the farmers being the villains and the farmers being the ones causing the problems to the farmers actually becoming the heroes of the story. The farmers being the ones who actually were maintaining their stewardship of the reef and they were they were protecting um, the reef themselves. And it was a clear, a very emotionally relevant example in, um, in uh, driving right and tapping into the farmer identities and helping to protect the barrier reef. So this program was very successful. Um, when only before Project Pain Changer, there had been a 14% uh, percent adoption of the area covered uh, by cane, the Cane Changer region, it, it ballooned to over 48%. Um, there was a 480% increase in farmer adoption, and that led that was like 49,000 hectares of land covered um, by this new management practice, and it really drove change um, in making uh, the practices more acceptable and more adopted by the, the target audiences. So um, Claudia, on the next, if you can jump over to our next slide, uh, as we're kind of wrapping up to make sure there's room for questions, we wanted to point you towards a few resources if you're interested in learning more. Um, one, 
Our team at the Center for Behavior and Environment does live trainings. We do them twice a year. The next ones um, are in Spanish in September and English in October. But if you wanna get a little bit started or get a taste first, we have an online self-paced course that you can take uh, to get your hands um, wet in practicing behavior center design and learning some of the tools and resources and steps along the way. We also, you heard a little bit about an example, the Our Fish comes from Rare's Fish Forever program. Um, you can, we encourage you to learn more about uh, Fish Forever. There's also a portal that we have online that has all of our uh, data and information. It's all publicly available, so please check that out. Um, and then we also have this new website and resource that I'm super excited to finally launch. It's uh, Applying Behavioral Insights to Water Pollution Challenges. It includes um, plastic, solid waste, waste, human waste and wastewater, agricultural and industrial runoff. And it includes both um, academic research and some of the scientists talking to you about what they found, as well as practitioners on the ground telling you about their case, store, uh, case studies and successful um, examples of doing the work um, out in the field. So check it out. Um, we're super excited to kind of get this information into the hands of more people and more practitioners worldwide. And then last but not least, um, next slide, Claudia, we encourage you to join behavior.rare.org if you're not yet members, it's free. Um, so don't worry there, but we have all sorts of tools and resources for you as you embark on your journey to apply behavior centered design and to use behavioral insights in your environmental work. Uh, we have worksheets and guides, there's articles and case studies, uh, there's different literature reviews and academic um, peer reviewed journal articles, all sorts of information that's there um, related to this topic of behavior change for the environment. So we hope you'll join us in this journey. Um, we hope you'll check out the different resources. We are excited to talk to you more about the role that environmental, uh, that behavioral insights can play in tackling environmental challenges. And yeah, I thank you. And I think we'll have some time now. I think we left enough time to be able to jump in and tackle some of the questions. Um, I know they're in the chat, but I don't know if you also have some, Sarah, in the Q&A section as well. Um, we just have one in the Q&A right now, um, but we do have some in the chat. And I just remind everyone how to ask questions. You can type them into either the Q&A or the chat, and then I'll read them out loud to Katie and Claudia. And and and. Claudia and Katie, thank you so much for, for this presentation. It was fascinating. Um, I, I'm going to go back to one, and it was, would you talk about nudges? Sure. So nudges are a very specific type of uh, intervention. We often think about nudges in the category of the choice architecture. Uh, so in choice architecture, you're changing the context and timing of a decision-making environment. Oftentimes nudges are considered to be part of a type of choice architecture type uh, lever or change. Um, for example, if you change a default or you change um, some wording, some little bits and pieces, nudges are often um, tools to give a little uh, nudge in the direction you want them to go while still maintaining your audience's ability to choose. Um, so for example, when you have a default for even printing double-sided versus single-sided, your audience can still choose uh, to do one or the other, but you kind of point them in the right direction. So what we often talk about in nudges, and our center has some work coming up, and I'm not the best person to speak to it, but um, nudges have gotten quite a bit of publicity over the years uh, for their sometimes very effective ability to drive change. Nudges are not always effective and not always effective in environmental settings. It depends on the type of challenge that you're trying to address and the type of um, your target audience and what motivates them and all of those different things. And so we have some work that's actually coming up soon uh, to talk about the role of nudges in, in specifically environmental contexts um, because they can be effective and they can um, not as well. Okay, thank you. Um, a question, how can we use behavioral insights to influence policy? Sure, so um, there's lots of different ways to think about it. Um, I will say there's the most recent issue of behavioral science and policy. It's an organization and a journal actually just recently included a special issue on the role of behavioral insights in driving policy. I think it's more specifically on climate interventions. We have 
our team had an article in there, but there's lots of others from around the world um, who involved it. Um, my main, um, one of the comments that I think about with policy, there's a few areas. One is politicians are people too. And so just like you would map out how to drive uh, change for any sort of uh, individual in any sort of other context, you can do the same with a politician, just understanding what motivates them, what are their barriers, and then how can you uh, tackle change. There's also ways to design behaviorally informed policy. So there's research out there you might have seen on my slide where I talked about how um, under the rules and regulations that sometimes if policies aren't aligned with social norms, they can be ineffective. And that's true. There was some research by um, Christina Bicchieri, um, who's out of the University of Pennsylvania, who identified that um, if your policy goes strays too far from a social norm, it actually won't be that effective in um, gaining adoption and people following uh, the, the uh, new rule that you've enacted itself. And so there's lots of ways that you need to be thinking about policy and applying behavioral insights uh, that align properly. Um, there's tons of examples out there, but I will, um, I think we can jump in. We could always dig in further on that specifically, but yes, it's very relevant to policy uh, context as well. Okay, thank you, Katie. Um, a question, uh, well, a statement too. Choice architecture approaches can sometimes be hacky stop gags to truly long-term solutions. How do you think behavior change interventions should fit into the broader landscape of financial and policy incentives? I would say that I think from um, Fish Forever experience, it's there. It's not a one or the other, um, you know, approach. We do need both, and so well, I think. One of the initial things that we do in our interventions is really start with a landscape uh, policy analysis and really try to understand like what is the enabling policy already in place, for example, to devolve authority or of co-management to communities. Does it exist? Does it not exist? Right. And so our whole kind of like policy and governance team will then kind of work towards, you know you know, putting that in place. So uh, that will kind of meet kind of the ground level work and this at a time when uh, all of our community engagement work, you know, is as advanced to the point where, yes, you know, we are like, community feels and, you know, and is ready and wants to also have that kind of um, responsibility. So I would say, it isn't, it's not a one or the other. I think you have to be very clear about why you're using each each strategy for and for what purpose. And so once like that, um, I think that uh, understanding, then you can use either or um, depending on what it's most appropriate for. So I hope that helps. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much, Claudia. Um, another question that came in, um, this great webinar seems designed to change the behavior of the audience. If this is correct, could you be explicit about your theory of change of which this is a part? So I'm assuming this means that you're, that this webinar is a part of trying to get practitioners to be more effective at applying behavioral insights to environmental challenges. And yes, that is true. Um, we would be very excited at the Center for Behavior and the Environment if um, environmental practitioners use behavioral science um, as much as they possibly could. I think that we believe strongly that environmental challenges are behavioral challenges, just like um, I started with. We've done um, some research and actually some research out of the uh, Future of Conservation study found that um, less than 10% of, of conservationists report that they have experience in behavioral and social sciences. Our research, we did another survey of uh, 500 IUCN and this, uh, Society for Conservation Biology members reported that um, less than 15% have any sort of training in behavior, applying behavioral and social sciences. And so it's, it's a gap that exists in this field. And so part of what we're trying to do at the center is get these tools in the hands of more practitioners in whatever format is most effective for them um, to get them to adopt and, and use these tools effectively. Um, so part of this webinar and part of our theory of change at the center is that people are interested in this stuff. They know that it, we know that behavior change, people know behavior change is important. Um, and sometimes they don't really know where to start or they don't have tools that are actionable and practical for them 
um, to start using and applying. And so that's part of what we're trying to do in our theory of change is not only build awareness of what is out there, but also start building capacity and access. And that's part of why behavior.rare.org is free um, to get these tools in the hands of more practitioners as possible. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, going back to small scale fisheries behavioral challenges, how do you cope with a situation where fishers are cheating fish buyers and supply and fish? Data collected are not trustworthy. Yeah, I think that's a really great question, um, Sylvie. Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by fish fishers are cheating the fish buyers, but I do absolutely agree that data collected um, is not necessarily trustworthy, just for many, many different reasons. I think that it's also um, because why we don't work with um, fish buyers in a void. We, they are part, for the most part, the fish buyers that we work with are a part of coastal communities. And that part of like a larger process of engagement. And I think kind of a little bit to Brian's point on like, um, you know, how we <laughs> engage with communities in, or to Brian's question around how we engage with communities initially, right? It really all starts with a, like a desire and a vision for what that community really wants and sees itself and then how the fisheries kind of supports that vision. And so in that sense, there is a full kind of, um, uh, you know, effort and and way of working with the community, but it's all about rescuing like the pride and contributing to that community well-being. And so it's not, uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 really about how do we build, I think, at a bigger scope, like the social norm that you know. Uh, contributing to the well-being of our fisheries is something that we can all do. And we all do that um, within like the roles that we all have, right? So if it's a fish buyer, it's about, you know, like reporting this data. If it's a, a fisher themselves is about, you know, yes, definitely respecting rules and regulation, also being accurate, you know, when reporting in like, how much, whatever species or whatever fish, if it's a fish processor, it's going to be something else, right? So I think there's, um, just to say the fish buyer is just one at like one stakeholder, but I think our work really is about working with the community uh, at large um, and, and providing the space and I would say the resources to, for them to be able to um, better manage, you know, what, I mean, their livelihood and all, and all, and all mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much, Claudia. Um, another question that came in, can you talk a bit about how you determine target behaviors? Are these targets developed with the communities you work with? Sure, um, so yes, we are. when we are working with a community, that often means that we will co-design with that community, um, with local leaders and with community members, developing management bodies and all of that great stuff. Um, to develop the target behaviors themselves, we have a fair number of uh, different tools and resources. One of which that we often use is called a problem behavior actor worksheet, where we actually will map out the problem, the different behaviors that are contributing to that problem, and then the different actors, and then work with uh, the, the key stakeholders who are in the room to then prioritize which are the behaviors that we want to address and who are the actors that contribute and which are the priorities there um, so that it is something that is very clearly laid out and that everybody, um, we often do like different voting and conversations and we often do that in a workshop format though, depending on your own situation or scenario that may not always be the most effective approach. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you, Katie. Um, another question, um, curious to see if the center has used some of these tools to help people start eating a more responsible diet in rich countries. Latest studies show huge environmental gains from eating less animal products. Yes, so um, we've done quite a bit of research actually. Uh, the, the responsible diets often are also contribute, climate contributors too, not only to deforestation and all of that other um, 
challenging stuff. Uh, so yes, we've done some work into identifying how can you promote plant-rich diets. We did some research very specifically around um, the climate mitigation impacts that would exist, and then how do we um, drive, motivate them. We have a program at Rare uh, called Climate Culture, which is focused on, it has many different um, carbon mitigation um, challenges among the top kind of opportunity actions. One of them is uh, 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 responsible diets. And so that is something that we're trying to reach. And you'll find some more information on behavior.rare.org, but also on Rare's website um, on the climate culture uh, group uh, to see how there's, there's research there. But yes, it is very applicable on responsible diets as well. Okay, thank you, Katie. Um, and there was a question, I Claudia, I think is answering it, but there was a question. Um, I'm a PhD candidate. Oh, no, that disappeared, never mind. Uh, Claudia answered it. Okay, would you say people's uh, drive to act is more fueled by the doom or by the gloom? <laughs> I would say neither. Um, we have found, and there's some research that's coming out that, um, positive emotions actually can be much more effective in driving change than negative ones. Um, that is also something that uh, the Future of Conservation Survey, if you look, most um, uh, conservationists are actually pivoting away from the doom and gloom types of scenarios and headed more towards the motivation and act, um, action. Uh, the fear-based messaging can be very effective sometimes at quick change, but long-term change um, fear can often kind of go into fatigue and it can wane and um, doom and gloom is not always that motivating in um, driving action. So we would, we would go toward more towards the positive emotions um, in trying, in when you're trying to drive action. Okay. Thank you, Katie. Um, question. Can you talk about how behavior change design has been used for changing actions of large corporations? Sure. So this is probably a much larger conversation um, than we have, have time for, but there are ways. Um, when you think about corporations, corporations are actually made up of people. And so there's ways of using um, behavior change tactics just the same way and identifying what kind of motivates um, change along the way. One um, example in the water pollution space that I know of specifically is work that uh, Paul Ferraro and one of his colleagues did uh, with wastewater dischargers. And they actually sent a letter to wastewater dischargers in Kansas, in the United States, the companies, uh, to let them know about how their discharge compared to other dischargers in the area. And just that letter, in terms of the peer and social influence reduced uh, the, uh, their each uh, of the targeted corporations discharge pretty um, by several percentage points, which even though that sounds small was actually quite a bit in terms of the amount of pollution that it, it reduced just in sending a letter um, telling them what their peers were doing. And so that social influence becomes hugely important even in a corporate context. So it's really in identifying what are the the key drivers for the people who are making decisions, and then how do you motivate change based on those drivers? Okay, thank you. Um, going back to an earlier question, um, let me see if I find it. Uh, this was on our fish. Based on what was our fish created, could it be that it didn't work because the goal was not audience targeted? That's a great observation. And um, yeah, I think there is a lot, I think that we can kind of go back into like the history of, of the apps. This is an app that was brought into the program um, and we were not involved, let's say when, when it was brought on, I think to be able to kind of go deeper into, you know, what the actual kind yeah. of um, need we're trying to solve for and what the best way to maybe solve for that need was or a different way, right, that we could solve for the same need. But yes, absolutely, it could definitely be a mismatch. Um, and I think, again, this is why the, you know, I think as conservation is done, kind of as the conservation field um, evolves, we do recognize more and more like the value of 
precisely having these types of tools and these types of conversations really early on in like our programmatic design and um, in and just kind of like how we think about our projects very early on, because I think we can probably think of, um, I'm not we can, I'm sure that we can then devise solutions that are at least multifaceted, right, or multidimensional that can be um, very flex, much more flexible and um, adaptable to, to different contexts and reality. So that's a great question, um, great observation, and, and agree that we had had these types of tools and thinking, you know, four or five years ago, we this webinar might have been about something else, <laughs> or at least another example. <laughs> There's plenty of behavioral challenges out there. So, you know. Well, in uh, five years, we'll, we'll have even more progress. So we look forward yeah. to having you guys on. Um, thank you so much um, for this wonderful presentation. You can see some thanks in the uh, chat too. We really appreciate you being on and uh, sharing the, these experiences and insights and, and research with us. Um, and we look forward to the next one. Um, and thank you to everyone who's able to attend. We, uh, we appreciate you being on. We look forward to having you on future webinars. Okay, I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Okay. Bye, guys.